Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name's John Nobbs, and this is... Jacob Paint. And we are fellow workers with Ausfrank Theatre Film. Yes, we're uh, associates. Associates, <laughs> yes. as they say, elliptically. <laughs> and um, Jacob has been watching the training for a number of years, probably three or four, five years. Um, I've been doing this stuff for 25 years. I've been, our s company works on a... using a system called the Nobbs Suzuki Praxis. Why? Uh, which is a combination of my stuff and Suzuki stuff, Suzuki being Tadashi Suzuki, who's invented this international training system called the SMAT, Suzuki Method of Actor Training. So today we're going to have a little bit of a, a look at lots of the other stuff out there on the net that's been put out there, and we are going to critique it in such a way as to sort of establish some of the differences and variations, the things we're looking for, the things I think are being addressed interestingly in this other stuff and stuff that I think is not is missing the point so to speak and to that end we're going to watch some stuff and Jacob's more of a lay person's attitude to it because he's been watching the training he's done it once well that's about three or four years ago yeah I just did one one exercise basically not the whole training right but um yeah it was quite interesting I mean my, my background is more in in film acting mm -hmm. and I've done I've acted in some plays and whatever else, but um, this is very different to anything that, that I've done in, in acting. Right. So he's interested, I guess, in what we do and how that may apply to film acting in general, and so specifically, how do we translate some of this arcane or sort of confusing looking stuff? What does it mean and what's it for? So let's go. So we go to watch something and we'll stop, we'll shut the screen behind us. And uh, so I mean, the first thing I see when they're stomping there is just how hard they seem to be stomping mm -hmm. compared to. I mean, it looks different to when I see you, uh, in your training people stomping. Uh huh. What do you think's different about it? it just it's like. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like I'm watching it and I'm thinking, that must hurt. I, I feel for them, like, yeah. Whereas <laughs> your guys, I see them stomping, and, and they're stomping hard. They're, they're stomping. Uh -huh. But it, I, I don't... I'm, I'm not sort of watching them and thinking, ooh, <laughs> that's right. does that hurt? That's, that's, well, I think that's a very good point. I mean, there's one thing, I suppose, is actors do have a tendency to show you how hard they're working. Mm. And dancers don't. You know, they sort of just try to make it look effortless. But one of the reasons we think... Actors are very keen to show you how hard they're working, which I think is missing the point because I guess you're supposed to show, show how comfortable things might be. Now, the reason why I think you think that or why when you look at our stuff is because we're not concentrating so much on just making sound and working very hard. We're actually interested in what it does to us. So we talk in terms of instead of a stomp being a form of expressing energy, pumping out stuff, it's actually a form of embracing stuff. It's actually bringing stuff into you, which implies a sort of a softness mm. and a listening, yeah. listening to the floor, so to speak, and a softness about what you're doing. So, of course, whilst it's still very energised, we're thinking very much about what happens when you feel the floor. So with the stomp is not so much for us a form of banging the floor, but so much of actually embracing the floor, almost like you're mm. you know, hugging the floor, so to speak. And I think that gives a very different impression, as you can see behind us, because we are really concentrating not just so much. We're saying the stomp is the start of something. It's not the end in itself. I think when you look at this, you see the stomp as being the thing, the entire thing. But what we're saying is the stomp, or well, the value of the stomp is what happens to you after you stomp, what happens to you as you stomp, what happens to you in that nanosecond as you hit the deck, so to speak. Mm. And that, I suppose, is that's why it's more multidimensional in terms of your appreciation of it, because it's, you're, once again, you're looking at beyond muscularity, beyond aerobic. I guess people want to, it's natural, people want to do things right. And so that they want to, uh, you're teaching them a method or, or a training, and that they want to say, all right, what are the rules? So if they can then go through that checklist of the rules and say, all right, I'm doing this right because I'm, I've got everything checked. I'm doing it in the right way. Right. My, I'm doing this sort of motion, and all right, I've done it. I'm, 
I'm going to Zerki. Oh, right. Yeah, well, I think that's okay. a very good point. Well, whereas what, when, what you're talking about, it, it's, it's a feeling. There's something else there. So you can't check a box to say, I'm doing that right. And every time you do it, you're going to have to be asking yourself the same questions. Like, does this feel right? Yes. Rather than just saying... Well, how right. does it feel, I suppose, even more interesting than does mm. it feel right? I think you hit on a very good point there, very beautifully explained, because as far as we're concerned, and really when you think about it, acting's about feeling, isn't it? Mm. How often are you told as an actor, whether it's film or television, stop acting, just do it. You know, yeah, yeah. Just stop thinking about it, just feel it. And that's a very easy thing to say and much harder to do. Mm. And most of us try and approach this experience of being an actor through our brain. Mm. And what we've found, I suppose, is that you have to use your body to do it. Mm. And you have to log it up in real time and all sorts of things like that. That's yeah, so I've been shooting uh, videos sometimes and, and I can see body, somebody thinking too much about the words. And I can, they're, they're not doing so badly, but I can just see them thinking about the words. So if it's like a, a headshot, I'll get them to do something off camera, moving uh-huh. something. And that's partly an influence, I guess, of watching your stuff. Just, yes, well, that's... And I'll say, from this word to that word, I just want you to move this thing over there or, you know, do this thing out of shot so no one can see that you're doing that. But it just creates this thing that they're thinking down here about that and they can't think about it. Imagine you're talking to a specific person on the phone and you're telling that that, that story to, for some reason, because that's up to you why you're telling them that and who it is. So that's... And where am I looking? What are those words that I have to say? And am I saying them in the right way? Just don't look in the camera. Oh, right, I'll just keep saying those words then. All right. Okay, so it's not like how we do the It becomes a little bit more intuitive and just takes the edge off. Yeah. All right, when you're ready. Oh, splendor of sunburst, breaking forth this day, whereon I lay my hands once more on Helen, my wife. And yet it is not so much as men think for the woman's sake I came to Troy, but against that guest proved treacherous who, like a robber, carried the woman from my house. And now you're just do it one more time, but there'll just be the slight difference of having these two things on the table here. And basically you're going to start with your finger here. Yeah. And this is not part of what you're doing though. This is yeah. sort of... Separate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you so I'm still talking. Here, yeah. Doing exactly what you did, but the finger yeah. there. And by the end of the whole speech, your finger gets to here. Yeah. And so just try and make it an even move. And time if you get to bed. Yeah. And not necessarily looking. Yeah. No, that's not part of what you're doing. So that's that's like an off camera yep. thing. Yeah. Okay, and when you're ready. Oh splendor of sunburst, breaking forth this day, whereon I lay my hands once more on Helen, my wife. And yet it is not so much as men think, for the woman's sake I came to Troy. But against that guest, who treacherous, who, like a robber, carried the woman from my house. Well, I think what, um, if I might explain that in such a way as it, it, it sort of articulates that, um, basically you've got a conscious mind, you've got an unconscious mind, and you can say rational, you can say instinctive, you can say rational, you know, um, critical versus intuitive. But what we're saying here is that there's a part of the mind which wants to get things right. Mm. And they're concerned about, do I look good? All these sorts of things, self-critical things, essentially very, very destructive and certainly not constructive. And what you find is if you can get the people away from that zone into how does it feel, what am I connecting with, Um, that sort of unconscious just sort of stuff coming out without you sort of trying to make it happen, trying to sort of think of getting it right. And what that means is really getting the conscious mind to be present but secondary. Mm. So that you are the conscious mind there. And so when you ask that person to do this stuff off screen, so it's secret, that person is actually thinking about something very, very concrete, that this piece of something is doing, like you've got an A and a B. Mm. And A, they're never going to get lost because they, they know where they should be. Mm. Even, and of course, it doesn't really matter how successful they are because that's not the point. The point is this devolution of the, the importance of the conscious mind to become a witness 
Mm. Still present, still very much part of the experience, but not dominating, not intruding, and not criticizing. All those words like criticizing. And um, yes, that's what it's about. And Suzuki has said that the actor's only consideration is to consider what his center of gra- his or her center of gravity is doing on the floor. And that's the way of getting the conscious mind to, to, to do a job it understands too. Because yeah. the, the conscious mind understands that A's here and B's there. I've got to do that. What the conscious mind can't deal is, is things like elliptical feelings. It can't deal with those. It just doesn't want to know about it. It wants to know facts. Mm. So because it wants facts, you give it a fact, and that paradoxically frees up the unconscious mind to actually have its own experience. Yeah, yeah. And you find that it's very natural, and the audience isn't, audience as in you looking through the cameras, not going, I know what he's thinking. Mm. And as soon as the audience says that, then they're already there. They've, 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 they've seen it all. They've, they've, they've actually on the beach waiting for this guy to come ashore. Yeah, yeah. and it just that, that sort of, uh, I guess, back to that sort of mystery of what people are thinking. And mm. any time you can inject some sort of a mystery in, in filmmaking, I, I know, not knowing what the person is thinking exactly, you may as well have a voiceover. Sometimes it's that obvious. Okay, I can see what the person's thinking. That's they're right. acting it all out for me. I don't have to think about it. I can see it. Yeah, and. That comes down to the, I think, the audience's ego sort of rejecting the ego of the actor. Because mm. the, the ego actor is saying, I want to communicate this. I want the audience to get this stuff. I want you out there to think about something. And, of course, the viewer, the person who's paid their ticket at the cinema, says, no, I don't want what you want me to do. I want what I want. Mm. And what we found is that the actual getting into that instinctive mode actually bypasses the the gatekeepers of the, the consciousness and connects with the unconscious of the actor. And that's that's the nature of the beast we're all chasing anyway. I mean, I've just sort of articulated something that's true for all theatrical or filmic experiences. And, of course, it's not an easy thing to do. Mm. And the question is, what do you do to give these people something to think about, which is not the actual thing you want the audience to get? So. Jacob's given these people stuff off camera, so the audience has no idea what, what the conscious mind is doing. All they know is that they can actually see into the unconscious imagination of the performer. Mm. And that's something that I've just used at a point where I didn't have the time or, the, you know, we, my, my relationship with the actor, we, we couldn't go into some sort of more in-depth sort of way of having them connect with what they're doing or anything like that. And it's just a very simple shot. I need them to be thinking about something. But I think it's better than all this other stuff because so mm. how often does an actor say, oh, stop thinking, just act. Mm. It's very hard to do. So what Jacob did was actually give them a trick, yeah. a device, a job, as it were, to take their mind off the what the heart was doing. Well, I, I knew that the, the viewer of the video is never going to know what the person's thinking. They just need to be thinking about something else. Mm-hmm. And that was all, it was creating that mystery. Um, and that was all I needed. That's true. And you, you, not only did you actually make a demand on the actor, do the da da da, you actually provided the context in which he, he or she could actually do these things. Mm. You effectively gave them a time space construction, if I can make that elaboration, a time space thing, start on A, end on B, and knowing where that was. Now, the actor always, and of course, you can sort of go very fast and slow down. There's all sorts of ways you can do that, but essentially, mm. the actor's no longer lost. Hmm. he or she actually is because that's an issue too getting hmm. lost in your emotions getting lost in your psychology well I imagine the actor he's, he's probably sort of moving his finger or whatever I, I might be asking to do and, and he's sort of moving it along and at some point he's thinking oh I've gone too I've, I've gone too fast I better slow down to get to the end so he's going through this process of getting there and thinking about all of that but that's just all you can see that thinking in his face mm-hmm. and, and it's, it's that simple really for, I for, think it is, yeah. For something like that that doesn't need any more. The fact is you provide an answer. Yeah. Whereas leaving him to his own devices, he was thinking about too much. Yeah. And then it became obvious, sorry, he's, he's thinking about his lines, he's thinking about sort of looking over that way and looking a certain way and, you know, it was just take all of that away. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Well, back to the point of question. So where are we? So this is the... So you were talking about the fact that it seemed to you that these guys are looking a bit too... And I would say that that 
they're not being told to feel what they're doing. They're just being told to do it. It hasn't been explained to them why they're doing it, would you say? Can you say that? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know what they've been told. They're just, yeah, to me, it just, it's a movement and it's quite harsh. Mm -hmm. Harsh is an interesting word. This is a very, very ruthless type of training. Physically, it's very demanding. And I've always thought it's very important to teach it quite softly mm. in such a way as you, I think you should encourage the softer aspects of what they're doing rather than encourage the hard aspects because the hard aspects are there for everybody to see quite obviously. So it seems to me that the ones you want to concentrate on is not the obvious stuff, but the stuff that could actually make it more rounded, more fully developed. And what we've found, I suppose, is that if you're just teaching the, the hardcore boot camp mentality, you've missed a whole, se se a whole series of experiences, which is actually, what is it doing to the actor? What are they being informed by? How do they, can they take this stuff away? Mm. So, um, but since you, so you make that observation, which shows that if what we're talking about, and even that's sort of a less experienced position, are still getting the same stuff. Now, this doesn't deny that these people are working very hard, so we're not critic, criticizing at any stage their, 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 um, what's the word, their endeavor. Mm. It just seems like movements at this point. Okay. Um, which... Why do you think that is? Yeah, I, I, I guess, I don't know, maybe this is some sort of introductory thing where they, they've just, I mean, they, well, they're all in unison and they look like they've done it a few times before. It's not their, you know, first rodeo. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just, they're all like robotically sort of trying to do the same movement and stay in unison. Um, I, I don't know, that's... Do you think it's because there's no mystery? Yeah, I, I suppose because it's training, they feel that training is just about oh. doing the movements rather than performing. Ah, see, that's an interesting point. We always, we always insist that a sector or a vector of what you're doing is actually interrogation. You're not just doing a series of steps, but those steps are form of, like, you could say experiments mm. or questions. Of course, there's a physical aspect. Of course, there's you know a series of rules you must obey. I guess you know you've got to stay in time. But more importantly, what's it doing to you? What's that? No, what's that stuff for? Mm. Is it just for being active? Would you get just as much out of running around the block? Some sort of aerobic other experience. So what's it for? And what does it do? What is it about what it is that it does something to you? So your danger here is really just doing a whole series of types of walking. But more important, well, so more importantly really is what, why, each one of those walks is actually a type of challenge. As you know, it's quite difficult to stop. It's quite difficult to do the pigeon toes. This is called the waniashi or the crocodile step. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm suggesting what you're talking about here is there's no other story going on. There's no wave part of it, there's no duality about it. It's just a series of movements. Mm. Now, I would suggest when you're watching our guys do it, of course you're seeing the same language in a way, although we don't do this step because it's a bit too complicated. Um, I could talk about that. But essentially, it's really not, there's no other world going on. There's no, there's no performance going on. There's not even a performance, is there? There's just a form of activity, mm. which for me would mean it'd be the same as any other activity which is not performative. Yeah, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking it, if that was a part of a film or a production, a stage production or anything, you would need something else to be conveying some sort of uh, mystery or emotion. Oh, yeah. and, and this is just something happening in the background which would be juxtaposed with it. Yeah. Um, because that on its that on its own is, is it's just not giving you anything. It's do you not... think when we do that stuff, what does that look like? Okay, one of the things that we do... I mean, they shouldn't be bouncing up and down either. Because once again, it's all just up, up, up. This is something that we do. We call the high stops.
So, I mean, what is the point in walking on your toes like that? Good point. Well, I imagine most most people that I know that are in film acting, they're going to be watching that thinking... So I never walk on my toes. What are they doing? It's like ridiculous. I never walk on my toes. How, how is this going to help me when I'm on set and I've got to play a character? You know, like, how is that going to help anyone? Well, the, 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 once again, this is training a sequence. This is not... This is not performance language. This is not mm. the stuff you do on stage. This is equivalent to a swimmer when they're training, having a splashboard between their knees so that their feet can't move, or swimming with one arm, or mm. breathing on one side. So what they're doing is creating a type of challenge, a physical challenge. As you can imagine, walking on tiptoes and trying to do all those stops is quite hard. Mm. Harder than it would be if you had your feet on, you know, the full foot on the ground. And so they should be looked at as a type of challenge to the centre of the body rather than just accruing muscular experience or learning how to do steps which might be used on stage. So this is exactly the same. Now, why does a, say, say a hockey player, right, or a soccer player, would use those little sort of witch's hats and they do these circles? Why do you think they do that? Mm. Why would you think they do that? Well, I guess that's actually sort of making me think about in relation to this, what's missing, and that somebody's going through those, uh, it's not just a question of getting through them, but you're actually sort of imagining that there's another person there, so uh, it, when you're actually playing a game, you're going to be able to dodge the other person, so that sort of movement backwards and forwards, you need to be able to control the ball and do all of those different yeah. things. There's a bunch of nuts and bolts, isn't there, about just skills? Yeah, yeah. But these guys, I guess from what I was saying before, that they're kind of doing the movement, but there's nothing else that I can see to what they're doing. So there's that other thing that they're not doing, which yeah. is sort of missing. So it's an interesting point, point you bring up about sort of when you're playing the witch's hats in sort of hockey or soccer, one of those ball sports, to imagine that, that witch's hat is actually another person. Mm. That's a very interesting idea, and I've never thought of that myself personally, but I'm sure, well, of course, that's got to be the end result, isn't it? This, you've got to give this witch's hat a physical potential mm. like it would be a thing. Otherwise, you're just doing an exercise. I can imagine as a soccer player, you're sort of doing those exercises and, and on some level, you're imagining the other players and you're sort of dodging side to side and, you know, mm. at some level, that if you're just imagining the witch's hats, then you're probably well, you're not missing much, a point. There's not much challenge, is there? Well, of course, there would be a challenge in terms of nuts and bolts, you know, not falling over and not kicking the ball out of the way. But of course, you add this other person to the equation, mm. it becomes a completely different ball game because that other person's actually also moving, or at least potentially moving. So you'd have to grad, grab it, graduate from this simple sort of A, B, A, B to this thing being essentially a hostile challenge mm. that's actually active rather than just sitting still like a post. Now, of course, it's not, it is actually a post. But in, as soon as you sort of do it with respect to this thing, might do something else. Mm. That's adding a huge level of challenge, isn't it? And a huge level of interest to the exercise. So what we talk about in that tense, or I guess you could say this other thing, is we say, don't just stop. I want you to stop the world. I want that all the stuff around you should stop at the same time. So not only are you stopping, but you have this idea that the space around you is stopping or that the whole cosmos is stopping. Now, this isn't a proof or a truth, but you can imagine it, even the invocation of doing that to your simple high stops would actually give it a value and an appreciation, which means that we're watching going, wow, oh, there's more going on there than I thought. In the same as, shall we say, a hockey player would do that with the sticks. Mm. It's a very interesting point you bring up, actually. Something I've never thought of, funnily enough, but when you bring it up, of course, it makes sense. You've got to have the other, don't you? Well, if, if anything, I think... We've probably helped, you know, sports people when they're training in our conversation just to sort of actually think. Well, oh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not I've never, they're not just witches' hats. Yeah, I should be thinking about it a bit more because well, I, I'm. I mean, I haven't played sport competitively since I was in high school, which is a long time mm. ago. But I can't ever remember being told that. I must mm. admit. So I'm not sure whether Manchester United thinks like that. I don't know, but I imagine they'd have to because you are with some of graduated thinking, aren't you? It's. It's. I think it's possibly also just the difference between. Sometimes what makes people better or worse, some people just naturally will be doing that and other people aren't. That's a pretty good point. That's a pretty good point. So even doing this, I guess, somebody, some people are naturally going to be performing and, and imagining something else and putting them, why am I on my toes? This is like, I'm not just going to walk on my toes. I'm going to... Yeah, well, that's a pretty good point. So once again, see, that's taking, that's taking the whole experience as something that's much more transformational. 
And Jackie would always say, what is the audience getting? What does the audience get of that? So we would say to those people, what do you think the audience is getting? You can't know what they're getting, but you can have an appreciation of what they might be getting. Mm. And of course, that's going to change the way you look because you're, just, you're not just you know, pounding ways of hoping they like you or whatever, but something about what are they getting? And also you've got to think, what's the space between them and the, and the person, the observer? That space is an active principle. Mm. It's not just a void, like a you know, ditch that you throw things over. It's actually a thing. Mm. You know, it's like a sort of a umbilical cord or sort of a, a big beam that connects you. So we've found that when you talk to people about those things, when you su- suggest these things to the actors, it becomes much more multidimensional. Much, it has much more other stuff going on and always we find it's much more compelling to watch. But that's a... Mm. Did you just think that up? Mm. Yeah, about the, the witch's hats being an active principle? Yeah, yeah, I don't know, just said it and it related to what they were doing. And it... Wow. Shows what's happens in the moment. <laughs> That we would say that arms shouldn't be moving so much, mm-hmm. showing lack of knowledge. You can see like the, the different ability of the different people, like that guy in the red shirt there, he's obviously a very flexible guy, you know, um, a lot of movement and other people have different body types and abilities. So that they do the movements naturally very differently. Uh-huh, what do you think that means? Um, yeah, I, I, they, they, I guess they just need to be aware of who they are and, and how they imbue that movement with themselves, I, mm-hmm. I suppose. I don't know. So explain further. What, what was your first point? That some people have got different abilities to others. What does that mean? Well, I mean, like the, the guy in the red there, just he's obviously very skinny and he's, he's like very flexible. Yeah. He can easily do all of these different That's you know, right. He's loose than the others. And, um, whereas some of the others, different flexibility and that they can't just flick their limbs all around all over the place like he can. Would you say you could see that, that difference in our guys? Oh, or uh, would you say our guys are more, not as differentiated by this structure? I don't notice it when I'm looking at, at your workshops, but mm. obviously when I think about the people in your workshops, there's a, a, a vast difference in the different people um, and their abilities. Some people aren't physically capable um, on certain levels um, and others, like a, due to age or whatever else. Um, yeah, but it's not, it's not a question then because it's not about the way that they're moving, mm, see. It, like being able to do the movement perfectly sort of thing. What we encourage in actors is that they should really be feeling what they're doing. They should really be sort of questioning what they're doing. They should be what we call interrogating what they're doing. So as you do these experiences, this is called, we call this the, what do we call it? The sawtooth. Um, and they do it slightly differently from us. I don't think there's an issue there. They do call it a stomp. We don't do a stomp there because there's plenty of stomping everywhere else. But that's not a criticism. It's a, that's just a sort of choice, a stylistic choice. But because, well, because what we really are most most focused on is what is it doing to you now that question what is it doing to me everybody can do that everybody can think that is valid as anybody else Mm. that is not a you know a closed question that is an open question and this person here could think about that as powerfully as those two those three women following him Mm. so then it becomes not doesn't become about body facility it becomes how much are you using the experience rather than am i good at it Mm. and I often say this, I've been doing it for 20, since 1991, so I've been doing it for 26 years or whatever. I'm having the same experience as the newest person in the room. Otherwise, if I was doing it differently and having a different, a more elevated experience, it would be about form. But because it's about method, it's about how it does stuff to you rather than am I good at doing this, am I good at standing on one leg? Mm. Because being good at this exercise actually doesn't have much meaning, does it? You're never going to do this on the stage. So what, what's the point of being good at it? So there's no point of being good at it. What sort of tool is it, like a transformative tool? Is it like the witch's hats in hockey practice? Is it like the kickboard, the splashboard mm. in water? 
as I say, all those things should be like that. So, this, I mean, this is, you know, Suzuki sort of method, but mm. Suzuki doesn't do this on stage. No. Um, so all of these different walking methods and all of that, when Suzuki puts on performances, they don't do all of these. Yeah. Okay. So, so and may, many people might think that. I, I suppose you could argue the slow motion stuff, which you will see sometime, he does do on stage, but I don't think that's a step. Mm. That's just doing stuff more powerfully and slowly. So I don't... But no, exactly. That's a very good point. This is not performance language. This is training mm. language in the same way as... But you're trying to replicate what happens in the game in much the same way as, you know, rugby players with that big punching thing into those big sort of padded leather doodads, you know, the padded mm. doodads that... Yeah. Um, it, what's different about performance, of course, is you have no opponent. Mm. There is no other team looking at you, really. So, of course, it's a fabricated event rather than actually a challenge between two, two groups of you know, players. The, the aim of either one is to win the game. We don't have that, of course, in thing. Mm. So, of course, there is a difference between our training um, because it's not, it has got no outcome except what's it doing to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm interested now, like, watching these people thinking, what they're, they're trying to do these, these moves and these to certain steps and to whatever degree they're getting it right or wrong or whatever, I don't know, whatever. But what, what is their purpose for doing those moves? Because they're, they're not intending to do it on stage. If, if they were practicing for some sort of dance performance on stage where that was the move they were doing, I can understand mm -hmm. you're rehearsing how to do that step properly. But it's not a step that you're going to do on stage. So what are you getting from it? Why are you doing it? What well, that's, I think, your question you've got to ask, and that's why you've got to look at this thing more profoundly than just doing it again and again and again. Mm. Um, you can argue, of course, that each one of these, you know, you do the pigeon toe, of course, you're trying to turn in as much as possible. That's a challenge to the body. Mm. Um, this one here, you're trying to go as fast as possible and have a sort of a sawtooth or jagged thing like that. And, of course, you, you've got to place your foot down like this, or go to the camera like that. And of course, the next one's got to go like that. So what happens is because you just creep forwards, if you don't watch out, you've got to be very quite powerful about putting this one here and that one there and then that one here. So there's a, I guess you call it an accuracy. And we would call that a type of knowledge so that you, I know my body's here. I know my body's here. I'm, rather than just a series of sort of continuous events, there's a whole series of stops actually, mm. I think there should be. And you're saying, I know I'm here and I feel myself here. I know I'm here and I feel myself here. Mm. Yet you, you don't want to, you don't want that to be everything that you're doing, just thinking about putting your feet in the right spot and doing those actions because you need to have something else going on. Otherwise. Well, I think that that's part of the conscious mind is not where's my foot going to be? Mm. Where's my foot going? That's the conscious thing you talk about, the equivalent of your A, B piece of string. Mm. And that's your conscious mind. But of course, then you say, what's actually happened to me as I do these things? And the conscious mind's got this clear imperative. I've got to be there and I've got to do this and I've got to have my knee up here and this whole series of... And my, it's my body moving around. You notice mm. here that there's a lot of upper body movement. He's quite good, going red. And actually, they're not bad. I, I wonder, I mean, that they might also be uh, told, like, they, they know that they're being recorded. So whether they're doing this differently because they're being recorded just to demonstrate these moves, um, I, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, it, we think everything's a performance. We mm. are always talking to our actors. No, there's somebody out there. And you're preparing for when they're going to be there. Mm. They're not there now, of course, but you, you must be, not pretend, but do the stuff as though there's a bunch of people watching you because then you're preparing yourself for when you go on stage and you're saying your stuff or making your dance or singing your song, that there's going to be somebody there appreciating that. Mm. And you've got to expect that, that experience because if you just pound away and not have no conception that actually in a couple of days' time I'm going to be performing on a deck with a big black hole in front of me, Mm. and a bunch of people on the other side of the hole staring at me and expecting something from mm. me. I mean, that's a big, big shock. And if you're not preparing for that somewhere, well, what happens when you get there? Oh, jeez, you know, what they call stage fright? Mm. They're just not prepared for this immense challenge to their psyches from having a bunch of people staring at them, mm. generally in blackout. So you look at this void. Here they're looking at the room. They're looking at all this stuff on the room, and they're quite comfortable because they know where they are. Yeah. But you just take all those that, that wall away and put a big black hole there and put a bunch of people on the other side of the thing. Mm. That's a huge shock to anybody, to me, you know, even with my experience, to anybody would be. Yeah. And you've got to have something that buttresses that so that it doesn't you don't just get lost. Where were we? 
<laughs> yeah, so there's, um, what are we talking about? Oh, this idea, are they performing for the camera? Is it different? Mm. Well, that's a very good question. I don't know if it's different. Um, I would, it looks to me like they're all, I don't, I don't think that those people are concerned enough with, with what they are doing is how is it being perceived. I, I guess it would be odd that you, you do your workshops and your training and then the cameras are turned on and you just go through the motions. So you would think that this is, uh, this oh, yeah. is a, this is in some ways a performance um, for the camera. It is. Rather it than is just a performance. A it's a type of performance, and it always must be a performance because mm. otherwise it's just a series of exercises with no potential. Of, well, I'm going to be doing something like this with, with, with a whole bunch of people in front of me. So mm. it's not the performance, yeah. but it is a performance. Mm. Okay. This is the old cocky. This is the hardest one. It looks the hardest. In fact, these guys aren't going down enough, I would reckon. But Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I guess some people can and some people can't, I suppose. Well, that's, that's an interesting point you raised, and I think it's very important to consider is all the exercises you're giving people. Like, for instance, you know, going back to the witch's hats and the hockey, gun, hockey player, everybody knows what that means. Mm. And everybody, certainly everybody in the team, would actually have a, a modicum of understanding what that means. Some people would be a bit more adept than others. But everybody could do it, couldn't they? Mm. Everybody in the team, even the goalie probably, you know, with all the stuff on, could still do it. So is how much of the training language, the steps, can everybody do it? Because if everybody can't do it, then you've got some people who are actually excluded from the experience. They can't experience this thing. Well, I, I guess how much of a challenge it is for them is part of their performance, isn't it? Yes, but if they can't really do it, they can't actually experience it. They literally mm. can't. If you can't get down all the way to a cockroach like that, you can't really experience it. It becomes just a trial. Mm. And as I said before, this training has got a very strong degree of ruthlessness about it to an extent that no other training I've ever seen has. Mm. Um, and you also must alleviate that with softness too. So. I guess if you're in a group of, of people and you're the, you're the one that can go down and do the move the best, but yet everyone else is struggling to do that move, then you probably feel a bit more relaxed because, well, look how good I can do the move. Exactly. And, and you wouldn't feel that there was any sort of need for you to do more than that. That's true. And of course, some people will be able to do anything, but you're trying to minimise that. One of the differences between dance, it's got a whole series of, sort of exercises, but actually before you get in the door, you've got to have a certain facility. If you haven't got a certain boxes you can tick in terms of turnout, et cetera, et cetera, mm. then you can't really experience it. The genius of this stuff that Suzuki's invented is that anybody can do this. Mm. Anybody can do those walks. Anybody can walk on tiptoes. And you might not walk as well as some other person, but you can still actually do it. Yeah. But a lot of these things, like the cockroach, you can't really do it. We don't concentrate on that too much because, A, you never do anything like that on the deck. I've never seen, nobody does that to walking around with their things at all. Because at least you might do tiptoes. You might do mm. pigeon toe, you might do slow mo, but you don't. You're not going to do that. So, we cut down those parts of the training which actually do exclude people, some people from it. Mm. Um, we're about to watch here the ten tech of ten. I guess you could say this is the one thing you could see on stage that we might do or Suzuki might do. I think you can see the girl on the left. When she first took a couple of steps, she just took steps and then she started to get into connecting uh, with it a bit more. That's a good point, isn't it? What made you think that, do you think, apart from you obviously? Why, what, well, what did she change doing that made you think that? Uh, apart from slowing down, it was... She just seemed like there was more of a connection through, I suppose, her body or something. Um, Whereas she could have just been walking down the street for the, the first step. I mean, I can, I can explain why. It's mm. very hard to start something. Mm. 
Yeah. It's very hard to go from zero to being at speed. Yeah. Because of what she had, what she sort of, what we saw really is that her centre sort of jumped off. Mm. And then she caught up with her centre, if that makes sense. Okay. So it's very hard to go from there and to sort of straight away. Mm. And we talk about, no, it's your centre moving first. Your centre can move before your feet move. Imagine sitting on the chair or anywhere. I can actually start moving my centre before I move anything else, really. Mm. And walking too. You see, you can probably move your centre probably that much before you have to move. Mm. From there, you start walking. So we say, no, it's your centre moving. This is not a foot exercise. Because you do that because your centre goes straight away. The foot just does what the centre requires it to do. Okay. Of course, as she got moving, that became fine because she was moving into the centre of alignment. But actually, to start off is really hard. Mm. It shows you how hard it is to actually start something. Yep. Much more difficult than you might think. Because mm. what most of us do in a walk is we fall over. Yeah. And then we catch up. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, a, a walk generally is a fall and catch. Mm. Fall, catch, fall, catch. Um, this type of, this type of, shall we say, stage walk... It's not so much that, it's actually the centre moving, being generated. There's not so much of a fall. Mm. Um, why do you think we do this exercise? Why? Um, I'm not sure specifically. Um, I, I mean, about just sort of control, um, connection with... Uh, you're creating a certain limitation, I suppose, uh, and... By, by having to move so slowly when you want to move faster, and, but there must be more to it than that. Well, that's part of it in this way. Obviously, it's very hard. I mean, it's, when you're watching these people do this stuff, they're very vulnerable, aren't they? They can't hide behind any clever steps. Mm. They can only just be themselves. And so it's quite, it's a real challenge, of course, to be quite convincing at that level. But the other thing we think, well, I think it's very important to do is that it gives them a mythical quality as they walk like that, and we can't see them because if we turn around 90 degrees, which you can show with our stuff, you can actually see that it looks like they're just coming forwards in time and space. And if you are just walking towards the camera, sort of going plod, 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 left, right, left, right, so to speak, then the person looking in the camera or the audience in terms of a live performance will actually think in quotidian terms. When you go like that, it's John Nobbs, it's Brisbane, it's 2017. But if we're talking about a myth like Macbeth or Hamlet or Oedipus, you're trying to look as though you transcend daily stuff. Mm. And there's two reasons for one is you're trying to look like something that is a myth because mm. it's not a real person. Yeah. Hamlet's not a real person. In fact, you can argue anybody on camera is not really a real person. Even the guy playing Winston Churchill is not really Winston Churchill. Mm. And if you saw Winston Churchill on camera, because he's dead 50 years ago, so... But yeah. somebody playing somebody else, which is what we all are, playing something else, none of us are playing John Nobbs on, on the camera, are we? I mean, Tom Cruise is not playing Tom Cruise. He's playing Mission Impossible or something. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, he's trying to look a bit larger than life, isn't he? He's trying to look like he's worth looking at. He's not some guy just walking down the street. Mm. So the explanation for that is that when you're walking left, right, left, right, you're in daily time. You're in ordinary time. And the audience will actually start to think in audience, in daily time. Did I turn the coffee machine? Did I turn the oven off? They'll start thinking those things because you've actually, you're not mythical anymore. Yeah. You're not magical. You're not something, you know, you're on the big screen. You're larger than life. You've actually got to look as though you're larger than life. And if you just look daily, but of course, the other thing goes, ka-chum, like this. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's one of the reasons we do it. But the other reason, of course, is it's just, just it's very hard to do. They've got to really know themselves, don't they, as they walk like that. Mm. They've got to really know, are they, am I just sort of flopping around? Am I really in this spot in time? Or am I just sort of in the room somewhere? Mm. What we call knowledge. They seem to get better as they get further into it, don't they? Yeah, I mean, she, she's definitely sl slowed down a lot. Um, these two reach the wall very quickly. Whereas ah, that's a good point, isn't it? And they're obviously walking in unison with each other. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't say that. We think you've got to have your own experience. And if you're a tall person, obviously, you're going to have bigger steps than a small person. Mm. So we say you're walking with everybody else. And in this context, we're walking through the music. We're not walking to the music. Mm. Now, 
how they start to turn around. I guess what, how can you describe the difference between these guys turning around? Can I say that again? Uh, no, I, mean, I, I think that, that that girl that in, in the, uh, the green shirt. Yeah, she, she seemed to, she's the one I think that's gotten the most into it the whole way. And oh, everybody right. else is kind of just, they, they turned around, they said, oh, I've got to hold my hands somewhere. Um, whereas she sort of turned around and just felt sort of, I mean, I put my, like her hands just went somewhere. I, I didn't feel like she's just taking a pose. She's uh -huh. kind of come around and just, that's just where she ended up. So you think that that's more intuitive or instinctive, more or less, what we say, prescriptive? Yeah, well, it felt, well, it looks more like she's feeling it, whereas the other ones, I'm, I'm watching them and I'm thinking, oh, okay, they're thinking they're about what they're doing. Position, they're um, holding yeah. a position. Why do you think that's inherently more interesting than watching somebody make a position? Or Because she's drawing into what she's doing, whereas if, so, if you can watch somebody thinking about something and you know that they're just trying to do a thing, then you're not drawn into it, you're just observing them. So you think what you're saying is that when people are instinctive, they're automatically more watchable. Would you say that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you're saying that with your film stuff, aren't you? You say mm. when a person's instinctive or... Intuitive, instinctive, they're sort of the same word. That's, mm. you know, either one's as valid as the other. Yeah. So when they're being more intuitive, it means they're feeling something more, would you say, rather mm. than thinking more, feeling? Yeah. And that feeling's more interesting to watch, isn't it? And whether she is or not, maybe she's, she's just a good actor. Well, she don't even know what she's thinking. Of course, we, got no, we can never know what she's mm. thinking. But we can see when people are thinking too much, can't we? Uh, yeah. That is... That's the truth. Yes. Mm. We can, we we actually don't know what any of those people are really thinking, but we do know when they're thinking too much mm. and not feeling enough, which I guess is pretty, pretty interesting, pretty pretty um, instructive. A again, I mean, she might be thinking about like you know, what she had for breakfast or whatever else. And well, actually, then it turns out it doesn't matter what she's thinking mm. as long as she's not thinking too much. Yeah, because yeah. we can tell when the thinking is overriding mm. or dominating the experience, but we can't tell what the thinking is or the feeling is. We can't even tell mm. what the feeling is, can we? We just know that's an open-ended word that can mean... And we're not talking about emotional feeling, are we? Sad or happy. We're talking about feeling as in sensitising. Mm. Sensitising, sensibility is what Suzuki would call it. I guess it's, it's, it's a connection to something that's happening rather than somebody just being sad or whatever um, it is nothing. But if there's a connection to what else is happening, why um, is somebody just being sad? Not you say it's not really anything, or it's not really valuable. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. It's somebody being sad rather than I, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to describe. But there's um, well, you're talking about what they call generalized emotion. Yeah, yeah. Being sad, I said. Well, why are you sad? And how are you sad? Because just being sad, and we've seen that so many times on theatre or film, don't we? Somebody's just being general, like gen emotional. Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of equivalent to being just busy and active mm. rather than having meaning. Mm. So when we're saying when this person comes around, as she did then, she, she makes this sort of thing, and that's very gradual. Da, 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 da. And then she sort of carries it, I suppose. But if you're just sort of active, mm. then it doesn't really mean much, does it? Because it's just busyness. And what that means is you're just sort of occupying time, hoping you don't look too bad. Mm. You know, so we call it finger painting. Yeah, yeah. And that's a directly equivalent to emotional, just being emotional, mm. isn't it? If, it's, if it hasn't got some sort of knowledge point, if it hasn't got some sort of why is it so or how is it emotional, if it's just the outpouring of, shall we say, emotional energy, it hasn't got much value, has it? And certainly, I mean, I've heard so many directors say that, you know, don't just give me emotion. You know, don't just be emotional. Don't even generalise emotion. It doesn't mean much. It's just actually a form of anxiety of wanting to be busy so you're not seen to be sort of not doing anything. Mm. I think that's pretty... So what we're talking about here, I guess, is there's nothing special about what we're talking about. We're saying, well, how do you address it? How do you deal with this person thinking too much? No, I give him a job to do. You've given him a format. You've given him actually something to take his mind off the job, so to speak, mm. off the experience.
that's I guess something that I, I personally I tend to overthink things. So it's well, I think we so, all do. You know, I, I, some people more than others, but um, see here they're doing something different from what most people. They're doing a three sixty degree turn, which I think is really good. But we've done it from time to time too, because you're seeing, you know. It's very hard to do that, of course, because, you know, the feet aren't made that way. They've done a 180 degree turn, not 360, haven't they? They've turned... No, they did 360. They turned 360, yeah? Yeah, they did, because they've done... No, they've done 180, in my apologies. <laughs> Sorry, getting confused. It's when, the, when the two girls um, connected there, when they came around in the middle... Um, oh, yeah. Like, it was almost like the, the girl in the green gave the other girl a little bit of what she was doing. And that they rem- there was a <coughs> connection between the two of them. With they moved their hands, and and they seemed like they were in relationship to each other. And the guys that they sort of got there, and they thought, all right, now we have to change our our pose. And so they just moved into a different pose, whereas it wasn't really. It, I mean, how, how can it, what it, what does it mean? It doesn't really mean anything in relation to the other person. But well, I think it's interesting there because what you're suggesting, as far as I can see, is that the guys were just doing what they were told to do. Mm. There's a demand. You must do. You know. You should do this at a certain time, which is fine. But there was nothing more than that. Now, when the women did the same thing, of course they obeyed the same command. You know, turn around at this moment here, or whatever. But they also added something else. Mm. So they, you could say, they owned it. They mm. owned what they did, whereas the guys were just doing what they were told. Mm. So it's very crucial to, to 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 make this distinction between the demand, which is actually this is the rules, it's A, then B here, and how do you own that? And you're saying, I mean, you're actually opining or observing that these girls did something else, whereas the men just did what they were told to do, and that was actually pretty much your very much words, weren't they? Hmm. Now, even if that's not true, you perceive that. And this is somebody who's not seen this before. We've never seen these guys do this stuff before. So it's interesting that you should be able to make that judgment of what they did just on their body language. Yeah, yeah. You said, no, they just looked as though they were doing what they were told, whereas the women were doing something else. You said, in fact, you said, it looked as though the green woman gave this black woman energy. Mm. Now, that may or may not be true. It doesn't really matter. But the fact that you could think that as an observer, as an audience, that you gave them a, a story or a narrative which may or may not be there. But you couldn't think that with the two guys because they were just doing what they were told. Yeah, I mean, they're obviously, they're trying. Oh, yeah, uh, they're, we're not talking about endeavour at all. No, and they're putting a lot into it. But And on, on another day, maybe they, they, they do it differently. For whatever reason, they just, at that point, they didn't But the fact quite... that you can make that judgement, you can make that observation mm. on their body language... If if, they were, if I was in a room and they were on either side of the room and I was sort of watching them, I, I feel like I'd be drawn to watch the girls more than the guys just because there's something going on there that... I, I, Over I and above the demand. Yeah, yeah. This other thing going on. Yeah. That's what was interesting because they were told to do that. They were all told the same stuff, presumably, but the men, men didn't really... And I'm not saying they didn't do that. I'm saying they didn't appear to do that. Mm. There was something lacking in their body language which made us think they were just sort of doing what... They were just obeying the rules. Yeah, is that over and above demand, as you say? That, yeah. I mean, with all of the stuff they've been doing, it's that even on the tippy toes, there's just that something else always over and above the demand of what you're yeah. doing. Yeah, and that's really what makes it... That's amazing, and I, I would say that over and above is actually a mystery. Mm. What those women did then was something mysterious and fascinating because we couldn't put our finger on it. We couldn't say, oh, they did so-and-so. All we could do is come up with a sort of a scenario mm. which described something we got from them. And I think that's really what theatre is sort of about. And it's a mystery because mm-hmm. you can't actually say you know for sure what they did. You can say you know for sure what they, the men did because mm. they only did this, um, obeyed the rules. Mm. So you can see in a sense there that whole, <coughs> excuse me, that whole, idea of what theatre is about is actually completely encapsulated in that, what, 45 seconds of, of, um, of exercise. Mm. Um, I think we should stop there. Mm-hmm.